Thank you to everyone here today for joining the September GDCS seminar and helping us to kick off the fall semester with what will be a phenomenal and thought-provoking list of speakers and topics. What happens on land is deeply connected to what occurs underwater. This concept is known as Ridge to Reef, and it is critical to the work that we do here at the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science. That is why we are so excited to have Dr. Kim Falinski with the Nature Conservancy joining us today. Dr. Falinski is an environmental engineer advising Ridge to Reef conservation projects in Hawaii and Palmyra Atoll. She earned her PhD in Tropical Plant and Soil Science Solutions from the University of Hawaii, and now she focuses on green infrastructure solutions to mitigate sediment, nutrients, and pollutants from watersheds that affect coastal water quality. Dr. Falinski's recent projects include monitoring the effects of a native Hawaiian restoration for a 200-acre wetland in Windward, Oahu, partnering with the USGS on erosion control management recommendations on Hawaii Island, and developing quality assurance documents for a citizen science water quality project in collaboration with the Department of Health. Thank you, Dr. Falinski, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kim Falinski, and I'm talking today about moving from data to action, taking wa coastal water quality data to inform watershed management actions. Um, let's see if this is going to go for me. Um, we're here today because corals are in decline across many places in the world, and there's only a limited number of tools in our toolkit in order to try to stop this decline. Um, some of them I have listed here. You could manage for herbivores to try to keep the macroalgae down. You could reduce coral damage from nets and dredging. Um, you could take a big top approach and reduce climate change impacts, including ocean acidification and bleaching. Um, or you can see where I have focused a lot of my time on improving water quality, um, land-based inputs into the system that are often detrimental to corals. Um, there are a lot of different ways that water quality can be impaired for reefs, um, and I've listed some here that are especially important in Hawaii. Um, legacy agriculture, on-site disposal systems, wastewater infrastructure, stormwater and urban contaminants, Water, big watershed disturbances like ungulates and fire, um, recreation, which most people aren't thinking about too much, but you can really stir up the nearshore sediment if you have thousands of people every day, and sunscreen, and new developments, um, which are sporadic but can also cause problems. And each of these have different signatures in the pollutants that they contribute um, and different sources, and more importantly, different management needs, management numbers, um, the economics of each of these are different. The stakeholder groups are each of these are different. So being able to identify which water quality impairment you have becomes important. Um, on top of this, and adding to the ball of yarn that is water quality and dealing with land-based inputs is that water quality is spatially variable. And so if you're looking across a bay, this is um, Mauna Lua Bay here on Oahu. You have turbidity high in some places where you have nutrients high in other places. You might have glyphosate across the entire bay. I'll show you some of that data later, but it's not going to be uniform and it's not going to affect the corals in the same way. Water quality is also very time sensitive, especially in Hawaii with our flashy storms. You could have a pulse of sediment that lasts 15 minutes and sticks around for six months. You could have um, a pulse that only lasts, is, is different, right? So you're going to have a temporal aspect to the water quality impairment. And then to add to the economic picture, there's not a lot of great solutions out there to doing this. Um, I have four here, um, kind of spanning the range of how people work. On the top left is removing vegetation from the stream so that it can flow easier. In Kahana, you have vetiver planting on old agricultural roads on the top right there. You have upgrading our wastewater treatment facilities on the bottom left, and then you have green infrastructure solutions like permeal build pavement on the bottom right. So what you do and where you spend your money to try to improve water quality varies greatly and the economics change a lot. So the question I've been asking is to try to understand where, when, and which water quality parameters impact corals. This is kind of the active research question that, um, that is out there right now. So I've split this into two sides and um, this is kind of a new breakdown for me, but 
that there's an issue of scale here. So communities often will go out and say, oh man, I think the water's dirty. Let's figure this out, right? What do we need to do on land in order to solve our water quality problem? Is there a problem, right? Does the data show there's a problem? Where do I put those projects? And then when I put a project in, did it improve in water quality? So it's kind of the, the scale of say a small mugu or small um, watershed. But on the regional scale, then you have to think about looking at those broader health and water quality connections, right? Where is the impact the most? Do you have a dose response in that you have the most, most amount of pollutants land st staying in the same place that are actually able to impact oral health? And this affects the prioritization by funders, by the larger nonprofits who can move between islands, between places easily, and the county planning documents, and then statewide efforts that are looking at legislative solutions like the cesspool working group. So I've been thinking about this in terms of these two scales. And here's the spoiler, is that if you try to figure out and identify single projects that have actually improved water quality in Hawaii, your list is kind of short and it's mostly accidental. So the non-accidental ones are things like when we can upgrade a wastewater treatment plant or when you can maybe eliminate goats through fencing as is in Cavella, one of the flagship projects that you will hear about later. Um, but then there's the things that are not really planned, but will might help things. Like, so if you're fixing your lift stations and your other infrastructure because people need wastewater services anyway, when you stop planting sugar because it's not agriculturally viable, when you maybe stop the new development on a ridge because you just finished all the development and your stormwater is routed elsewhere, um, when you have a volcano bury your cesspools, very efficient way of removing your cesspool inputs in one specific place. Um, and then when you just have a way of protecting your wetlands through conservation, right? You don't actually have to act actively restore said wetland, but said wetland can't convert into something else. So these are like the ways I have seen data change or data improve, or at least data stay the same for water quality gains. And it's not all that encouraging because those things are often out of our control and aren't kind of the smaller projects that communities are working on to improve water quality. So I'm putting kind of the conclusion at the beginning, which is not typical, but this is sort of where, where you're thinking about is like, what is actually gonna change? What management actions actually change things? And the time scale can be long. So some of these things might take decades in order to, to flush out of the system and to have healthy water quality after the end. So uh, working only looking first at that community scale, um, I'm looking here at, at a, a circle of how this works when you work with a community. So the manager is interested in water quality data, probably because there's been some sporadic measurements that say, hey, we have water quality impairment, people are noticing turbidity in the water, and they're interested in improving water quality, or they see the reef degrading and are looking at water quality as a possible land solution. So then you have experts to try to guide some water quality sampling and design. And then maybe you can have more advanced studies help to trace kind of specific pollutants that you might be tracking. You analyze the data, you can communicate back to partners, and then it informs a planning process for coastal water quality data. So this circle here is kind of like the, the ideal situation, but that green box at the end often becomes a challenge. So I'm gonna go through a couple of case studies that Nature Conservancy has worked on with project partners um, across the state that show what does that look like in practice when communities start investigating water quality and then try to implement solutions and where does it really get us today? So the first is a project called Julio Paviola in Leeward, Maui. It started specifically in four or five watersheds in West Maui with the West Maui Ridge to Reef um, um, Initiative, along with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council and the Nature Conservancy. And so this project started to, because people were saying, hey, we think that the water quality is impaired on the reef, but we don't have long enough term data to show it. We don't know if things are getting better or worse. Um, and we have an active group of citizens, starting with the lifeguards, starting with people who are working in our community who really just wanna do this. And we wanna do it so that it matters and we wanna do it in the right way. So this organization was formed in 20, the first samples were in 2016, I think. 2014 is when we started having those conversations with many, many stakeholders from federal to county to state who are all saying, yes, if we have the data, we'll be able to implement this data and start to make change, the changes that we need. Um, and it's been one of the more successful citizen science monitoring programs, not only here, but across the country for its longevity, for its complexity. Um, the sites that we've been monitoring along with our collaboration with the Department of Health are in the upper left there. So all the way from Honolulu at the top of Maui down to Hihikino south um, at the bottom of the leeward side 
Um, and all of these sites get monitored every three weeks by a team of dedicated volunteers, like in the upper right. Um, and so the parameters that they're measuring are chemical parameters like nutrients. So we send them off to a lab. They're in situ dissolved oxygen and turbidity. Um, there has been part of the program focusing on Terracoccus, but we've been since phased that out. And phytoplankton chlorophyll A is often measured, but for this program, I think we've only measured it a little bit. So the answer to these parameters can answer the question, do we have a problem and is anything changing? And with the 40 sites that we have here, um, this, the, there's some of the program um, informations here that they're time independent, uh, tide independent, meaning any tide can work, but they're time constrained. So it's only done between seven and 10 in the morning, um, have gotten hot thousands and thousands and thousands of samples for us to analyze this kind of long-term water quality. And the program has um, been especially interesting because it's set a standard for other programs around the state. It produced quality assurance documents that could then be used by other organizations. And there's now a new program called Hawaii Biola uh, in Hawaii Island that's reproducing this at 11 sites there. And the idea is, is that with this huge volunteer excitement that we have good data and that's backed by communities who understand that the data is being collected. And here they are working out of the back of a car. So where did it get us? We're now five years into the program and the technical team of the, the Julio Quaviola is sitting down on a weekly basis, trying to analyze the data and turn it back into recommendations, right? Along the way we've analyzed the data, but up until now, we haven't really focused like drilled down onto how can we use this data to really inform the best possible change for this coast. And what it gets us is, um, a pretty decent uh, picture of where water quality is not great. It gets us a temporal signal of how bad can it get at those sites. And it gives us enough data that we've been able to collaborate with researchers at NOAA to kind of pair with satellite imagery techniques to see if well, how good the satellite techniques are, right? So if you need to reproduce this somewhere else, you can either take this community-driven approach or now we have ways of looking at kind of longer term satellite data. And so it's been able to feed into processes like this. Um, on the left there, you have the Kapalua Bay data, and it's showing a decline over time, which we've later figured out was due to infrastructure improvements, or that's our, our current um, estimation of what's going on, on for that data. And of course, there's all kinds of rainfall and other modeling techniques we need to, to really prove that to ourselves. But this is where it gets us. It gets us a really nice, rich data set that can, for all of Leeward Maui, that feeds into other research projects. Um, but it doesn't drive down to that next question, which is what do we do with it? Um, I particularly like the technique, I've said some of these things already because it engages those community stakeholders on the ground. So if you need somebody to then go into the county office and say, hey, this new development is not really the greatest thing, we really don't want it. There's now data, data to back up what the status of the, of the water quality is right now. And it kind of makes ambassadors. Um, and, it, and it motivates further source tracking. So once you've like identified the big, the big stuff and said, hey, look at this, this is not a good thing. You can then use other techniques. Um, there's all kinds of isotopic techniques. There's um, that many of you are probably doing other, other ways. So there's geology techniques, there's um, pharmaceuticals, which you'll see later, but there's these secondary techniques that you can source track to get more specific on what the problem is. And it creates a baseline, right? So this baseline will now be available um, for a long time and is in EPA's databases. And you can start to look at, from a research perspective, coral health and percent cover and land use and historical land use. But translating into actual change. So instead of just watching the water quality over time passively, how does it inform the next phase of what it can do? Um, it's been a little bit more of a challenge. It did set a standard for statewide monitoring programs like this across the state, and it's providing that baseline data, and it's being used in planning processes, and all of those things are making movements towards being helpful, um, but it's having a harder time with the, the fact that some of the data is pointing to problems that are a bit more intractable. So on the left shows the legacy sediments in Honokawai. So unfortunately, the current erosion problems might not just be current, but the USGS, a bigger USGS study showed that there's a lot of sediments that are forming sort of a mantle, kind of a covering over the stream channels. So that if you really want to attack these loose, 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 fine sediments, you have to get into the stream channels and hold sediments in place during big events, which is not an engineering problem anybody really has a great solution for. 
And then there's the coastal erosion problem that it's identified that not all erosion is coming from Malpa, but that a lot of the erosion is coming from in the near shore. We're seeing turbidity events correspond to wave events rather than rain events, meaning that we're seeing coastal erosion problems for the first, and, and this is documented in our five years of data. It has spawned on new projects. So on the bottom left is Kahana Nui Reservoir. I love reservoirs. I think of them as great places to hold back sediment over time. And for the first time, we've ate, um, the West My Ridge Reef has managed to push forward retrofits to be able to clean this reservoir so it doesn't hold that lake behind it, but instead is able to be considered a retention basin. On the right, there's um, the organization Coral has been leading never ending efforts to kind of continue to plant out native species and vetiver to hold back sediments on the land before they get into those stream channels. So there's definitely projects on the ground, projects that do have the potential to impact the health of the coastal environment in the future. But the amount of sediments that are in the system right now um, prove to be very difficult to deal with. So while we went through this circle and we have managed to get with Huyoko Viola all the way around, We've analyzed the data almost, almost completely. The report should be out in the next couple, maybe say a couple months. But that last part of making sure to inform a process that gets to the point where you've actually shifted the system from a, maybe a turbid system to less turbidity or from nutrients going down is still a challenge. And it's a challenge because there's the scale issue, there's a financial issue, but there's also the those systems that really need to be taken care of are either wastewater infrastructure issues that are maybe outside of the reach directly um, or kind of bigger, bigger land management issues. Um, and in the case of West Maui in particular, there's legacy issues of the nutrients just being stuck in the groundwater from years and years of, of sugar cane. So we've gone through the circle, we've got to the end, we were really proud to get to the end, and now we're at this point of saying, how do we really get to this next step of seeing clean coastal water? So I'm going to give you a couple more examples of people who have gone through this circle. Um, some of you may know these examples, others not. Pulco in Hawaii, um, Nature Conservancy Coral, UH Hilo have all been involved for a long time. Um, this is a very specific input. There are cesspools here um, at this particular site. There's been coral decline over years and there's been coral disease identified. There have been lots of researchers involved in this project. Um, documenting water quality concerns, documenting coral health concerns, and it has a single stressor. There's a lot of OSDS, on-site disposal systems in this place, so you don't really need to go too much further than that. Um, you, have, you can provide good data to show that, and then you need to get to the solution. So in this case, um, really great data has been collected over time by TNC, UH Hilo, to show where the enterococcus hotspots are, where you have a sewage indicator score that's a combination of nutrients and enterococcus and N15, different types of measures of water quality. And so we have this great data, but that those next step solutions have taken time. And so while we get through all of this, again, we started with early research. We said there was a problem. This was maybe 10, 15 years ago. Coral, the organization Coral is leading the effort right now. They've already produced engineering documents and then they're working with the county to try to figure out the funding mechanisms to implement the recommended solutions, which include anything from moving wastewater to another, to another wastewater treatment plant next door or upgrading each of those OSDS individually over time. But when we get to the end, even after the data has shown exactly in this place pinpointed some of the problems um, figuring out how to finance those solutions involves that next step of working with the government and working with the counties um, to come up with the millions of dollars to upgrade the system. And Mauna Lua Bay on Oahu, they've gotten a little bit further in terms of the data recently, but there's still stuff on where to actually try to implement projects that are going to meaningfully um, change water quality. So this project is in partnership with Malama Mauna Lua and Doug Harper, and then a big team of University of Hawaii at Manoa um, researchers, the Megan Donahue, Craig Nelson, Henrietta Dulai. So the project was initiated by the Department of Health here in this particular site and went through, and instead of trying to get a really beautiful temporal data set like Puyo Kovaiola has done and be able to pull apart changes over time, the idea was to create a snapshot, um, a synoptic um, system here where we had 178 sites ranging from freshwater inputs that had already been studied um, out to the extent of the entire reef 
um, and try to take all of those site um, data points over a couple days at the same time with the largest range of parameters we could possibly come up with um, to see if they, with this new information, we were able to come up with better recommendations of source, better recommendations of sink of where in the bay that these um, that the pollutants ended up. Um, and I have the OSDS on this map, but that's certainly not the only source of problems in Mauna Loa Bay. Mauna Loa Bay is pretty urban. It's right next to Honolulu. Um, most of the downs um, bottoms of all these watersheds um, are very um, are suburban development, and almost all of the streams except for Guadalupe have been grayed over from about when they come at, down into those subdivisions, and so they're all kind of channelized. Um, creating for uh, problems just from the fact that you have water that isn't being absorbed into to places um, along the coast. Um, and from when you talk to people about the original sources of Mauna Loa Bay, it came from when the bay was developed and when those ridges were developed the first time. So like at the, at the bottom of it, the water quality decreased a long, long time ago. So it's another legacy problem that hasn't yet flushed out of some of these places. So with this great, with the now we went out, we took data from all these different parameters. I like turbidity, it's my favorite. So here's turbidity across the bay. You can get a really fine spatial picture of where you have kind of the most turbid conditions where you don't. And the managers at Malama Mauna Lua are asking, hey, which of these watersheds should we work on first, right? I can't work on the nine watersheds in Mauna Lua Bay. I need to be able to prioritize between them. And so this kind of gives us some of that along with the work of other USGS researchers and others, and it gives, gives us a sense of sync, but it's not necessarily gonna be the driver for why you work in Niu or Kulio'o versus working in the Hawaii Kai Marina area. And that's only because each of those watersheds has different um, uh, management options, right? So you have to be able to have cooperating landowners, you have to be able to have retention basins that might be able to be used to hold back some sediment. There's other confounding factors that after we manage to get all of this data, are it's, it's useful, but it's not really the only thing that's driving what management solutions are happening. And it also shows that a lot of the sediments that are in the system right now are kind of in there and not being flushed out. So whatever is being done now might actually take a lot longer to kind of see results in the bay than we intended. Um, for nutrients, this I put up total and total nitrogen, not nitrate here, um, but uh, corroborating a lot of other researchers who've worked in this bay, there are some pretty focused areas where you have groundwater entering as seeps, kind of under, underground streams per se, where you have SGD hotspots um, next to areas that have inputs that would make sense for hotspots, either wastewater problems or cesspools. And so this feels slightly more actionable. But the solutions, which are to get on the city and county of Honolulu's infrastructure upgrade list and the planning processes to do that are kind of the next steps or to figure out how to work with the landowners down at that bottom hotspot on the left there at Black Point. So you can see that while the data here, we're able to say, okay, actually we do have some great hotspots that we can really point out. Um, it works, but then there's that next step of integrating at the policy level, of integrating at the homeowner level and trying to figure out is this data the data? Is this is this what we want to follow versus the sediment problem that we identified on the previous page? Um, so one other thing that went into this study was the use of pharmaceuticals um, as tracers to try to identify wastewater, to try to clinch that argument more to say the nutrients are coming from specific sources. And so we used um, a combination of different um, compounds that had different half-lives so we could see how those compounds moved throughout the bay and try to see like what the residence time, how long has it been since this compound was um, released from its um, OSDS or wastewater injection well. And um, those maps prove very interesting, right? You can see where the glyphosate on the top right is Roundup and where kind of the the chemical where, where it's being stored as much as anything else, like where in the system do you have kind of slow water quality mixing because glyphosate will persist for a very long time. So if you have evidence of it, it means that the system hasn't been flushed out for a long time. And that map there corresponds pretty well with the map of the invasive algae in the bay where and that's, it is it becomes a question of maybe mixing that those those are sites where there's not enough mixing happening. The ibuprofen on the other hand on the bottom left there shows places where you have direct connectivity within hours, right, from the nearest source. And so in those places, 
ibuprofen doesn't last at all in the coastal environment. Those are places where you have pretty direct sources and can then work actually to say, ah, let's work with this landowner specifically or this set of landowners specifically to work on trying to remove that direct connect, um, much like in Fuoco where you have kind of a, a smoking gun. And the others are kind of the in-betweens to those, to those, the same story. So Moana and Mauna Lua, while they're working on um, stormwater upgrades like the permeable pavement for um, shopping centers, they're working on malpa management to try to restore uplands up there with different landowners. They have a lot of those projects started. The main thrust of their work has been removing invasive algae over the years to try to work in those areas where you don't have a lot of mixing and to physically remove it. And it's a great role for a community to be able to do that active restoration. So this has been the way the solution has shown itself in um, Mauna Lua, but they've, they're slowly working to try to figure out what scale and what funding lines they need in order to implement the larger changes to the wastewater system and the Malka erosion um, problems that they might have. Okay, one more, bear with me. Um, Pelicano watershed, and I'm showing you all of these because I want you to see how this data starts to translate into the projects that are kind of following it, right? Because the projects themselves often take a lot of work. Um, in Pelican and Watershed on Hawaii Island, um, we're working with a bunch of partners, including the landowner here, Forest Solutions as the implementer, Nature Conservancy um, as part of the South Kohala Coastal Partnership, a bunch of bunch of partners here. Um, the issue being that uh, over time that fire and ungulates have degraded the Pelican Watershed for decades. Um, you can see on the left of this image I have here is an area that hasn't seen burns and on the right is an area where the fire, the fire um, followed by ungulates took place. And so the idea here is this very large watershed, Pelicani is 14,000 acres, is to try to figure out is there a way to re retain the sediments on land well enough over the 14,000 acres to keep them from the ocean. And so here is a case where the water quality data and the coral data was taken quite a long time ago, showing that there's species decline, there's coral decline, especially after the harbor was built. But um, the solution being, if we're gonna try to stop sediments from entering into Pelicane Bay, we need to look Malka and figure out what kind of landscape scale restoration can happen. And so for this, it becomes an issue of identifying the hotspots. And so this work here is done by Mike Burnett. And this high resolution image, the yellow hotspots um, are machine learning trained bare soil detection. And they were able to take that 14,000 acre watershed and reduce it to 800 acres of, of land that is especially prone to erosion. So instead of having to think about restoring 14,000 acres, you can scale down the problem in this particular place. And, the, and this came after many, many years of thinking about the coastal water quality data and then working on land to try to figure out if there's a problem on land, if there's a, a, a solution on land. And the other half of this solution is, um, what are we gonna do? What do you do on 800 acres of land that's been degraded for decades? And so the Nature Conservancy is leading an effort there to do a pretty um, comprehensive uh, randomized design, a randomized experimental design plot system where we're fencing the area, test testing irrigation methods and testing eight methods of um, seeding and other types of revegetation to see which of those might be successful and then what kind of economics are going to be required in order to figure out how to deal with 800 acres of land. Like, is it possible? Do you just need to fence? Do you need to fence and reseed? If it's pri priority to be able to have it come back as a native grassland, then what's the best way to do that? Um, and so having eight different methods, we're using kind of soil busters, soil chicken foot system, we're using hydro mulch, which is kind of novel, but we're also doing seed scattering and replanting of, of vegetation and kind of the best of the dryland techniques to compare them all and not just compare them all to think about the scalability of them all, right? How feasible is it for us to do watering in these places? Um, and so this is kind of the next step on that is once you've prioritized, you have a water quality problem, now you've said, okay, I only have to deal with 800 acres. Now you say, okay, what in the world am I gonna do on those 800 acres and how do I fund it? And so this is that next step of testing that we're into right now um, of having, seeing where that data, the, the rabbit hole of the data goes down. So big picture, um, I started doing this from the state scale a, a while back. 
um, for my dissertation, I was thinking about modeling the whole state out. And I was thinking about how do I prioritize across the entire state, which is the best places for Malka restoration for Makai coastal water quality improvement. And um, this is a very old image, which is almost, it's slightly embarrassing now to look at because I can tell you where all the problems are. But this was a sediment export um, map that I made as a, one of the products. And um, I, I've refined it over the years and it's kind of the best that I have without going the satellite imagery way. This was a pure MOCA modeling method um, that we were using here. Um, I can get into the details of it, but I guess the point that I wanna bring out by looking at this big state scale is that all of the places that I just mentioned were not identified as hotspots necessarily on this map. So why do we work in the places that we work versus going after the places that I had highlighted back in 2016 as the places where you have the most sediment input? Or you probably could make this map and think about the sediment input per area, right? The idea that Lanai doesn't have a big input doesn't matter so much if in Lanai you have so much sediment in the coastal zone that you're kind of swimming in it, which is the truth. Or same with South Molokai, right? They're not necessarily highlighted if you're thinking about total tonnage of sediments. And then you can, you can look at this in lots of different ways. This is just one example of how to present data statewide that may not translate into where's the best place to think about doing malco management in the water. Because those places might be affected by legacy sediments from 100 years ago, or they might be affected by the fact that there's no soil layer left because of overgrazing. Or it might just be that you have so much urbanization that you can't dig up all of your channelized streams at exactly the same time and replace them with, you know, happy old style kind of natural streams that might be better at regulating flood flows and therefore regulating the amount of sediment that comes down the stream. And this is just for one parameter. It's not in considering all of the contaminants of concern that might be affecting the reef um, that we see are seeing more and more and thinking about more and more now. And it's not considering nutrient effects. So pulling apart this is pretty complicated. So that's not to say that planning on a statewide scale is completely is not important. And the point for me is just that there are other things that are going to the decision about the feasibility of project design um, at a specific place that matter. And having community support and being able to have community presence in that place and people wanting to take care is matters. And then as you're scaling up, having big landowner support, if it's a comparatively rural area, big landowner support to being able to do this is kind of a key ingredient to your puzzle. And if it's in an urban area, then working within your wastewater upgrade plans, working within your stormwater plans, working within your cesspool upgrade plans and helping your statewide layers that are showing kind of effects statewide affect that localized data of where to prioritize if you only have so much money and can only upgrade so many parts of your wastewater system or stormwater system at once. So for rural areas, I think that what I'm seeing is that you need these big landowner agreements and it's just as important as having a reef that is possibly able to be saved, that is resilient enough to be in the position where it can be saved. At the, um, on the other end of the system. So there are other decisions that are going into that. Um, and for the middle ground where you have an organization like Malama Mauna Lua, or if you have an organization like the West Maui Ridge Street, finding those scalable projects that both keep the community interest and have the potential to grow into projects over time that matter um, is the key. Uh, there are projects that can be done by communities, but how they contribute to the overall picture probably is leveraging some amount of government, some amount of county planning or statewide planning in order to really make um, a feasible chunk into what's going on. So this is a summary of those things. Um, our flagship for all of this, that we, that the biggest, the biggest success story um, that we've seen doesn't have any reef monitoring associated with that. And I hope the Nature Conservancy is planning on doing that next summer. Um, Kavela Watershed in Molokai, um, was fenced uh, probably in 20, I'd say 2011, sorry if that date is wrong, a little while back now. And there was a lot of work to done to see how that would be effect on land, right? How much of the vegetation would come back and the picture here shows the left versus the right. It's pretty amazing, but the vegetation came back on its own. It is the best example we have of sediment reduction over time with a fence and keeping ungulates out. Um, and it is a success story with that large landowner focus. 
Um, but the response on the reef hasn't yet been measured and we'll see what that has, what that says. Is the reef better off 20 years later because of this implementation? And in urban areas, thinking about those wastewater plans and whether 20 years out, the county can find the money in order to upgrade a particular stretch of a wastewater system to then see those declines. Just in five years, we've been able to see how um, taking out a, um, a leaking lift station in West Maui might be able to upgrade water quality on the time scale that matters. Um, shows that input of these things and input of the coastal water quality data into those infrastructure plans to help use ecosystem based principles to guide where things are are being upgraded is just as important, perhaps, as some of the other development type things that are going to inform where wastewater gets upgraded. And so here's some of those takeaways as the last set um, there that those focus-based community monitoring programs generate interest that is widespread and long-lasting and really builds community support. And those long-term data sets can feed into research. So they can be used to look at how well satellites work. They can be used to try to pull apart some of the coral health data and with auxiliary studies. And so they're very, very valuable to have long-term data um, that was taken in a good way. Um, but there is a mismatch for funding once the community tries to implement some of the solutions that are needed. Um, based on the funders, um, and that's and then you all of a sudden need governance style support. Research can help identify which pollutants are the most important and the most detrimental. So if you can look at the research in this that is really needed is to try and continue to decide which pollutant in which place is needed the most. Um, and then last, making sure once you have the data, make, seeing how to incorporate it into government planning processes so that it can consider ecosystem response. Um, and alongside other important um, county level decisions. And I thank you all for your patience and listening to all of this. There's so many projects I highlighted here. So here's just a smattering of logos to, to look at um, and many collaborators. And I'm very happy to take questions and I see the chat has come alive. So thank you. Outstanding, thank you. Adrian. Thank you, Kim. Uh, great talk. So now it's time for some discussion, some questions. Uh, I would like to start. Um, uh, I have talked to MIUN a couple of times from DOFA, and they're pretty much thinking about fencing projects to, to remove the ungulate problems in some specific areas. Are you guys coordinated with them? Because uh, I guess they are the guys that are ruling like what it's what is done in land. Uh, uh, but you are working with TNC and the rest of organizations coordinated with what DOFA is planning to do in those projects and in the coming years? A good question. Uh, I do check in with Emma quite often um, and I'm mostly filled in on the plans and where she's planning on going next. Um, I've been hearing a lot about the Oluwalu project um, and, and some of the others. So yes, could it be better? Yes. Am I glad that the state is considering that kind of large landowner as one of the largest landowners is considering how this affects things? Yes. Um, but I'll add that you don't just fence without having to maybe think about the community impacts of those things, that there's certainly um, that hunting, hunting pig and hunting for your family um, is a cultural practice that's important. And so making sure to balance out my overexcited recommendation to keep fencing with uh, what the community concern is, is important. But is the, how is that collaboration happening? I don't think it's formalized. It's a little bit looser than it should be about the where, right? Where is important to fence. More question for Kim? There are two hands raised, Adrian. Can you see those? Oh, wait, yeah. Uh, Uh, maybe Andrea, you have to do this. Jiwei. Of course, certainly Jiwei, go ahead. Jiwei. Yeah, so this is Jiwei. Thank you so much for the awesome talk. I really appreciate it. And that the, uh, all the citizen science and the data you gathered is awesome and all the planning. So I'm, I'm Jiwei, I'm the faculty in the GD Science Center. I use the satellite images, both the dough, the high frequency to monitor interability. So I'm very interested in your 
data collected, you see the strong relationship between the turbidity to, uh, with the nitrate or carbon, or did or you think it's not related? I, I'm thinking use the satellite to better quantify the nutrient. So the turbidity is an index. So I want to get know that. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, yeah. I am happy to share with you. I just recently started doing more complicated um, statistics on the HUI data. And what I'm seeing is that the turbidity axis and the nitrogen axis and the phosphate axis are quite separate. So most sites are not combined having turbidity and nutrient problems. Most sites are, I can think of a couple that are, there are overlapping problems. Um, this is for the leeward Maui data and I haven't pulled it across from the state yet. But for the most part, those problems are separate. And it seems like the, only, the relation would be tighter between nitrogen and turbidity that those two seem to be slightly more related than phosphate, which is coming down purely in groundwater. So yeah, I'm thank happy you. to share what I've yeah. done. Yeah, thank you. I will send you an email afterwards. Yeah. And uh, another one question. So uh, how do you decide which watershed management first? Because I see the like the turbid water or nitrate contribute from one watershed may be transported to the nearby watershed coastal region. So how do you manage that? If you have the very, not did have enough money to handle all the watershed together, yeah. I'd say that it's set two ways. One is by community interest. So if you have a strong enough community interest in a place, then you're gonna to wanna to make sure it's better regardless of whether you're managing for sediment or nutrients. So when communities come to us and say, we think we have a problem and we need help, that's one way. So it's not necessarily on the, the end goal, right? As much as the community itself. And then the second way is that the kind of prioritization that happens to get NOAA and NIFWIF and DOH and EPA, the big funders of the work forward enough that they can then pick areas probably happens five years before today. So five years ago, those priority sites were decided and that is funding the work today. And so getting into the process of who is funding where seems to be important in order to figure out where to work because they'll specify, I want you to work in Covella. When did that happen? Five years ago. <laughs> so you have to figure out how to get into the line to make sure that the funding follows the sites that we think are the most important to update. Yeah, thank you, awesome, thank you. Thanks, Kim. Laura, do you have a question? Laura, are you there? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Kim. Hey, everybody. Um, it's great to see you. Sorry, I'm at my parents' house and the internet is bad. Um, so I can't turn my video on, but um, Kim, great presentation as always. And I am I work for the Pacific RESA program, which is a climate change adaptation research program in Honolulu. Um, so I have kind of a climate question for you, of course. Um, you were mentioning rainfall um, and maybe temperature too, data that you guys wanna integrate with some of your monitoring frameworks. And so um, just a plug for the Hawaii climate data portal that will be coming live later this year, hopefully sometime this fall, um, that'll have real time daily temperature and rainfall data um, that'll you know, trace back um, for the record, the period of record, but also moving forward um, through time updated every day. So that might be a great resource for you guys, especially as you think about scaling up um, from that community level um, to the, the county or the state. Um, but yeah, let me know if you want me to put you in touch with um, Ryan Longman, who's the lead on the data portal and when that's going to be live. Thanks, Laura. Nice to see you. Uh, and yes, uh, please do. Uh, I think I've looked at that kind of data from Ryan directly, like handed over for West Hawaii. But if we have the same for West Maui, it would be super helpful. Awesome. Any other questions for Kim today? I think I have a question, but I'm not sure how to ask it. Um, what is the role in Hawaii, as an example? You, 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 people ask me a lot, why, why isn't there more federal? Why isn't the EPA doing more? And why, why, you know, what's going on with not federal research on this, but federal interventions, infrastructure? I'm just curious whether you connect with that through your work. I, I'm, I bet you do, but I'm just interested in the bigger picture of this and what are some of the solution pathways that might be brought in uh, from outside of Hawaii into Hawaii? 
yeah, I, I'll speak to West Maui and that the Army Corps has been in there for a long time. So I think of the Army Corps and FEMA and those processes as probably some of our best chances for thinking about some of this. Um, uh, the EPA funding comes through through non-point solution, non-point pollution grants, which are not really big enough to implement large scale infrastructure. So unless there's a different type of funding line, usually the EPA isn't there. Um, but the Army Corps and FEMA can, and I have seen movement to try to look at correlating coral health with FEMA, other FEMA goals, right? So protecting roadways and other things. But the ha that connection hasn't been made solid enough in the science. And I'm really speaking to say Kurt Sterlazzi's work and, and other Mike, Beck, Mike Beck's work in this space. So if that connection can be made and you can prove that if a declining reef then protects the road going from uh, Kahului to Lahaina better, then all of a sudden you have access to more FEMA money that would be in the pre-planning ways to do this. And I'd say a lot of that money is also attached to flooding. So flooding and sediment come together, right? Flooding and nutrient dumps from the groundwater are kind of an overlap. But that space is not really, has not really been gone after. I know that Yinfan Sang at UH is working on some of this and looking at extreme flooding events and how that results in different pollutants on the reef. And so if you can tap into that flooding money, I think you'd also start to see bigger, bigger infrastructure projects coming down. But um, I'm looking to see what, what Biden's infrastructure package comes with. I, I actually don't know, but if it's a lot of wastewater money, I'd be cheering because that, that's a big point. Super, thank you. There's about five minutes left. Any other questions for Tim? Go ahead and raise your Zoom hand. I'm so glad we didn't have any more Zoom bombers. That would have been terrible. <laughs> You and me too. Yeah. I learned a lot. All right, then we'll wrap things up. So appreciate your two. Oh, I saw a hand come up. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Kim. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a researcher in School of Geographic in Science and Urban Planning at ASU. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I really learned a lot from your uh, your points. And I might have a, a little quest, uh, question, which is about, uh, because you mentioned that the water situation at, uh, near the island is changing. Uh, so how did you decide um, the collection flow and uh, uh, you know, uh, collection through uh, frequency and uh, how to balance it b between the, um, you know, the outcome and uh, the meaning of that kind of collection. Yeah, I think it definitely depends on the site. Um, we decided on three weeks for Leeward Maui because of capacity issues. And we really intended the program to be long enough that having that many samples would one, allow us to get into EPA's database. If you have, you have to have 30 samples in two years in order to be considered a, approved data to go into the state's program that declares water impaired, which is a very, very onerous way of saying, we wanted to make sure we had enough data to make it into the EPA database. And we also didn't have an, enough money to kind of run samples more. So that's sort of where that sweet spot was. Um, I think that for stream data, specifically for turbidity data, we've started thinking more about in-stream solutions and kind of continuous measures, right? It makes a lot of sense to measure turbidity on the fly since it changes so often. Um, but for nutrients, we're still stuck with the bottling method until somebody makes those phosphate um, continuous sensors nicer. They're not, they're still hard to, use, hard to use. So I think it's just a balance of how much money we had to sample. And um, in, Mauna Lua, everybody had been sampled, lots and lots of researchers had sampled Mauna Lua, but in, in, on a temporal basis, right? Maybe once a week, once every two weeks, once every high tide, like much more frequent, but nobody had ever done that full synoptic um, picture. So the goal was to try to get a picture, a snapshot in time of what water quality looked like across the bay. Oh, gotcha, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thanks again Thank so for having me. Your talk, Kim, really appreciate it. And thanks everyone who joined legitimately. Greg, do you have any last things you wanna say? 
Uh, no, I'm just happy to see lots of people are sending thank yous in the chat, Kim. Thank you so much from me, from all of our team, from our center and our university. So thank you again, and thanks everybody. We'll, we will have another uh, land sea seminar in about a month. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Kim. Take thank care. you.